Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Well, hello. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Brought to you every Wednesday at 8 p.m. EST. That's Eastern Standard Time. Um, welcome back uh, to our creative shop talk podcast where you, yes, you, dear watcher, uh, get to interact with us if you're watching live. Uh, my name is Jamar Nicholas, uh, the Kevin Bacon of comic books. And also, I have a new one, Mike. You ready? I don't even know if you know who these guys are. P.M. John. <laughs> you remember P.M. Dawn, that group with the... <laughs> Kenny Wong gave me that one. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, you guys. Um, I am joined, as always, by my best bud and modern master of comics, <laughs> Michael Manley. And Mike uh, just uh, uh, landed the lunar rover down. Yes. Uh, he just jumped out, jumped out his rover. What's up, Mike? One small step for podcasts. <laughs> I love it. Hey, yo, what's going on, you guys? Uh, we were talking about Mike Manley's hoodie before we came on uh, on live. Uh, and what is that? And, Mike, do you have a favorite article of clothing? As you know how comic book guys always kind of wear the same same stuff at shows. Like, do you, do you feel like you? I do have a con shirt. You do have a con that, shirt. That, that that blue shirt. Yeah. <laughs> now I like it for a couple of reasons. One's it comfortable. Uh -huh. Right, it's comfortable. It's I think it's you know nylon or something. But mm -hmm. it also has pockets on the side, so you can put glasses, key stuff. Because you never have enough pockets or, you know, for your markers or whatever. So mm -hmm. I find that it's a very, I I sort of like uh, Hawaiian shirts. Mm -hmm. I like I like those kind of fun <laughs> Hawaiian shirt type style. Kind of casual. I'm a kind of a casual guy. So I like that. Oh, that's cool. I remember when Hawaiian shirts were all the rage and they used to call it the comic creator Mumu. <laughs> so many people. You know, I, 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 I have never have been and never will be a person who is in sync with whatever is cool. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I talked before, like when I was in high school, everybody was a punk, right? And they, you know, you had to have the the right amount of, amount of punkage, <laughs> you know, yeah. like your hair up or you know, uh, gnarly clothes with. Horn thing that yeah. seems to be just as much of a costume as it would be to like be putting on your shirt and tie to go work in the bank. Like you had to be right, you know. So no, I like I like comfort, you know. And I think yeah. I I like the Hawaiian shirts because they're you can get really cool, crazy, funny patterns yeah. and uh, or like even bowling shirts. But I like them way before. Before it was cool. Yeah, before <laughs> and no, I like it way after. Mm -hmm. cool. Right. You gotta you gotta make your own cool. You can't you can't get caught up in what other people want because the fashion is, industry, you know, changes you know, one year it's stripes this way, one year it's stripes. <laughs> right. All my stripes this way shirts yeah, are out of right. date now. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because when you look you look at um when I watch something like Stranger Things, mm -hmm. I remember those clothes, those gap clothes with the shirts with the bands and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I remember all those clothes from from high school. Yeah. You know? um, and if I had saved them, they would be worth a fortune. <laughs> well, you know, if I guess if anything, I might be the fashion guy here in our crew. You're much you're 10,000 times more fashionable than I am. <laughs> JRD just said comic artists are always at the peak of fashion. And I think he's being glib. But I, you know what? I don't know. I, I feel like I try I try to put it together. Uh, if I have a com a Comic Con uniform, it is probably my white fisherman hat that I always seem to have at a show. Um, and I also I also wear my uh, Michael Ringo shirt one day of this show, no matter what show I go to. Uh, so you know, I feel like it's you know, it's kind of you know, like you said, part of your uniform, and it makes you feel good. Like I don't really believe in 
superstitions or rabbit's feet, but you know. You know, like a baseball player, like, oh, I have to like spit tobacco on the left <laughs> side of my table during the con. <laughs> no, not that bad. You know, let what? me sign that for you. <laughs> You're like that all weekend. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Matt Ringo gives a shout out to the Ringo shirts. Uh, he would. I was wearing mine last week. Oh, uh, that's what's up. Yeah. It was just in rotation. <laughs> uh, all right, let's let's uh, get started, guys. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, if this is your first time uh, watching us, uh, hello. Uh, what's going to happen is we are going to have a live, yes, live, ladies and gentlemen, conversation with uh, our good buddy Tom Whalen. Uh, if you followed him in through the slipstream. I hope you hang around. We have lots of amazing content with great creators from all over the creative spectrum. I'm sure you'll find something you'll enjoy. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. You see the John. We're really repping Philly tonight. You see the John up there? Uh, Graphicsly are the good people who- From Clip Studio Graphicsly. <laughs> That's right. Who uh, do Clip Studio Paint, uh, our sponsor in good standing, and also our good buddy John Morrow over at Two Morrows Publishing. Uh, boy, boy. Mike, are there any sales going on at Two Morrows? Uh, I'm sure there always. I didn't. I don't remember getting a, uh, an email from John this week about sales, but there usually always is a sale going on on something. Mm -hmm. So it's always a good time to stock up on your uh, your back issues. Yeah, yeah, I had in my cart uh, some modern masters issues. Yeah, because uh, they were on sale for some of them were pretty uh, like eighty percent off or something. I think. Yeah, I was trying to run the table. I'm like missing a couple. You know why? Because I let people borrow them. My mistake. Mm. <laughs> you don't ever give out your modern masters, kid. <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a guy that has a hard time if I don't know you and know where you live and you're not like in the inner circle. I yeah. will not lend you a book. Yeah, I, I remember I tried for a while to like take stuff off your shelf. You're like, uh, uh, I didn't know you well enough. <laughs> you know, you can sit over there and read it, but you can't leave with it. Well, yeah, because some sometimes you know people let me borrow that tape, and then my boyfriend wants to borrow that, and then they they break up, and then they do to the tape, and you never see it again. You know what I mean? So yo, that's a violation. You guys, we keep bringing in these Philly legends. I don't know what what is happening. It must be in the water. It must be that Schuylkill fly. Water. It's in the it, water. It must be in the water. Maybe it's in the ice. Ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another uh, 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 person from Philadelphia. But you know what? I have to be sure because I'm not exactly sure if Tom is born and raised here or floated through. But we'll get to the bottom of that. We'll Maybe. have to give up the vowel test. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tom Whalen is our guest tonight. Some of you know him as Strong Stuff, uh, but also he's uh, one of the uh, leading uh, designers in the illustration field who does a, a lot of amazing poster work in uh, gallery shows and everything in between. Uh, we've known Tom for a long time, and we were just, before we got, got on air, we're uh, talking about how great we've gotten since the last time we've seen each other. So uh, let's just uh, get to it. If you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat or in the comments, depending on your watch, where you're watching. I can't guarantee they'll get on, but we'll do our best. All right, let's have fun. Tom Whalen, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Two, I, I have to say uh, that was a hell of an intro. And uh, <laughs> two things struck me. Uh, I have to get back into those modern masters because I haven't... Uh, I just unpacked them the other day, and uh, I didn't realize this was a fashion podcast. And <laughs> Sorry, if, yes. if it is, if it is, I am definitely in the wrong place. <laughs> You're gonna get your bolo tie out. That's right. <laughs> so hold on, Tom. We're gonna start off real strong. Our uh, one of our uh, lifers, JRD, says Tom Whalen is a freaking genius. Oh man, plant. That sounds like a plant to me. No, he, <laughs> I, you know, I saw he just tweeted for me. I was like hacking my way through a tweet trying to get this. Uh, promoted before we went live and he put out a beautiful tweet that I could just retweet and did everything I needed it to do. So thank oh, you yeah. for doing that. No, that's amazing. Yeah, man. Uh, you, you come uh, with a high pedigree. Um, and thank you know, you. just to, not that it really matters to people out there, but I think I always talk about the how strong the creative ley line is in Philly. Like a lot of people that you kind of bump all, bump around with in Philly are usually wind up being like masters of their industries and things like that. Do you have a reason 
why that is, Tom? I, I don't, and I, I feel like a fraud if I if I fully put myself in that camp because I, I kind of like you said, I did bounce through. I yeah. I grew up I grew up uh in the coal region, so about two hours north of Philly. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I uh Hazleton, a little south yeah. of Scranton. Okay. Yeah. Um so I and I went to Kutztown, so it's all it's all like a direct line pointing down. Yeah. Um, so when when we were kind of in the infancy of the PCS, uh, which is how I know you, uh, mm-hmm. I feel like that's when I spent the most of my time in the city. Mm-hmm. And we've we just actually moved out to Lancaster, so still in the state, but uh, tangentially uh, associated with with the city. Yeah, well, you know, it's you know a lot of people feel like Pennsylvania is Pittsburgh and Philly, and uh, yeah, a lot of like fog in the middle. Right, like, right. Know, like all, I think all roads point to Philly, <laughs> but that's yeah. just me. Not the people in Pittsburgh. Not the people in Pittsburgh. They would totally disagree with you. <laughs> right. They, there's a line. There's a line somewhere. Somewhere in the middle of the state, there's a line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Mike, why don't you uh, uh, ask Tom the first question, and I'm going to deal with the chat room here. Okay. So, well, why don't you give us a little bit of your your origin, you know, and how you got interested in what you do? What what did you go to college for? And were you thinking of being an, an artist? Was that something you you started out as a as a desire? Yeah, it was actually. I I can I always whenever I have to kind of nutshell the how I got going in this. Um, my grandmother owned a candy store, mm. and uh, I would uh, basically it was the first floor of her house. So I would go and every Sunday I'd sit in the back of the store, and she had a spinner rack of comics, and I was just. I would just live on that spinner rack and she eventually started putting them aside for me. And it just became, I'm sure you guys know it just, you're hooked. Um, and I, I always remembered like the summer of sixth grade, I started drawing seriously. My cousin had come up from Kentucky for the summer and, um, we were just kind of filling trapper keepers with, uh, with loosely full of these characters we were, we, we were creating. And from that moment on, I just kind of never stopped drawing. And it was a love affair with comics. And um, through high school, I, I just spent every moment I could drawing. And um, I, it came time junior year to figure out what I wanted to do after high school. And um, for some reason, it was either accounting or art. And thank God my mom <laughs> pushed me. My, my mom, I think my mom pushed me in the right direction. Huh. Were you um, good at math? I was, but I can't imagine having a career this long and in, in having it fulfilled f- fulfilling for me doing that mm. may have turned out who knows who knows where it would have led but you would uh, have been able to buy the cover of fantastic four number one <laughs> yeah, right 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 <laughs> well you know i was about to say that i know that there's an uh, this probably isn't a secret there's a lot of accountants and people like that who are big comic book fans because I'm sure you know we've all run into them at shows, or they're usually like some of your high, yeah, right. your higher end collectors who come up and ask for you know the special prints from Tom. Right, know. right. They can, yeah, so they, they can afford one it. of each. <laughs> there's right. yeah, there's some DNA in there that uh, that there's a through line. But yeah, uh, that is interesting. It's funny yeah. that you say that because actually when I was at the academy, I met many middle-aged, retiring, empty nest people who were accountants, lawyers, doctors, and had wanted to be artists, but their parents said, and so they went and they had their career, and then as soon as they retired, they came back. Yeah. That's fascinating. And I always, I, I'm so thankful for my parents, because it was a very blue-collar family, and um, it, I'm so thankful that they they believed in me. There was never a moment of like, you can't do this, or I don't think this is right. They, they saw, saw my love for it and, and kind of supported me from day one. Yeah. So yeah. Well, my, my dad thankful. was blue, co- blue collar too, literally blue because he was a mailman. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so oh, did you have, did you have a, uh, uh, I didn't mean to cut, a, cut you off tomorrow. So did you have an art teacher or somebody in school who was also, uh, no, I. It was all self-guided because I went to a, a very small Catholic school with zero 
uh, art program. So it was oh, okay. it, literally, I was learning to draw from reading comics and how to draw the Marvel way. And and I I, I wound up going to Kutztown uh, for their communication design uh, program, mm -hmm. which is a, a combination of illustration, advertising, and graphic design. So it was a really good spot for me because I was hell bent on doing comics, just being a comic artist. And probably sophomore year, I was in a letter forms class and I was trying to over render um, some projects. And I, a teacher took me aside and said, you don't have to render everything, every detail. Mm. You can, you can, he, he taught me how to, how to draw graphically. And that, from that moment on, that changed everything for me. It let me, um, I think that's opened up the, the gates to let me mesh illustration and design the way I, and typography the way I, you know, kind of what I've become known for. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting too because a lot of artists know nothing about type. I mean, yeah. they may be great at drawing horses or barbarians or whatever, and they have no idea of how to use type. I think going back, like I had that, I actually had a lettering class in high school. Mm -hmm. I had two. I had two vocational classes. And then a regular class, and the, one of the vocational classes, that's what my teacher did. She actually lettered, which is also what my grandfather did. But oh, wow. in succeeding generations, I would meet people who would do like nothing about kerning or, you know what I mean? Any of that, yep. logo design it, or anything. I've seen it so many times too. If somebody's doing a creator owned project and they're doing everything and it, it just falls apart in the design and type, it, it's, it's such a, a letdown. It doesn't. It doesn't kill the project for me, but you just. It's. It's a weak area for them, as, as it would be if I was trying to render, you know, do a pen and ink drawing in, in something I was doing. It's just not my, not my lane. Yeah. So did you? Did you? Uh, when you when you were in school, were you still trying to do comics, or had you switched over to doing illustration? I was doing comics kind of on the side just for fun and i was focused on illustration so i had a couple good uh, great illustration teachers that kind of exposed me to a, a lot of different media at the first couple years uh the way they have the program set up the first couple years is exposure to different media so you know watercolors and stipple and um and then as you move on you kind of they're not as much worried about media as kind of developing your skills in composition, which is what I love to do the most is taking, um, and I, I'll show you a little bit with some posters. I, I love taking a, a movie and breaking it down to characters and putting them back together and trying to tell a story. Um, so there was a lot of focus on not just the tools or the, um, the medium, but more about the concept and uh, getting an idea across typography, composition. Right. Now, did, were you interested also at that time becoming interested in um, movie posters and things like not, that? Or? Not, no, not necessarily movie posters. I don't think I did a lot with, I was a lot of like what you would consider pinup work. You pick, pick a character and kind of just do your, take your best shot at, at whatever character. Because um, the movie poster scene, at least the one that I'm part of now wasn't around at that time so we're talking like mid to late 90s i graduated um it was all photoshop I, heads exactly exactly um but yeah it was it was a lot of uh it was it, and i wound up staying a little bit longer um I, I was there for four and a half years so i spent equal amounts of time doing illustration and graphic design so i wound up uh working design job for five years after graduation before I got a full-time illustration job. So I feel like that also strengthened what I'm, you know, what I'm doing now. It was, it was designing direct mail and uh, logos like corporate logos and stuff, but it was invaluable for where I'm at now. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any uh, favorite jobs from that? Or do you have a, a moment in which you felt things are really clicking? When they saw the agency that I was working for, I kind of, I showed them when I interviewed my uh, portfolio, which included some illustration, but when they started to let me do some illustration work for their clients, that was, that, you know, made me feel like, hey, maybe I can, maybe I can take this and kind of steer it in that direction. 
Uh, I have a question from the room. So JRD, who's looking to be the MVP tonight, said, <laughs> had they stopped teaching things like linotype and screen printing by then? Yeah, uh, we, they, they, I do have to say, I feel like at least I have a pretty good background from Kutztown in traditional uh, Ruby lift. Like they were teaching that at that point, like how to do traditional separations and hand lettering and it, you could kind of follow your own path. You could go as deep as you wanted with, with a lot of those um, avenues, mm -hmm. but screen printing, no. I, and it's, it's funny because I still have yet to actually be involved in the actual screen printing of any of my stuff. It's all uh, done by um, huh. professionals all around the country. Um, so I, I don't have, I, I know, I understand the process, but I, I've just never had hands-on training. Uh, yeah, I remember my um, somewhere in my in my career at University of the Arts, I took a elective screen printing class, and I loved it. You yeah, know, it's it really unlocked something. And then uh, you can never get in the studio in the uh, in between classes because people were making bootleg Bart yeah. shirts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> using their powers for evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I I talk a lot about networking, Tom. Uh, was there anybody in your classes with you that uh, kind of uh, kept going in the business or anybody that uh, was kind of taking a different uh, road down down uh, into design that you were doing that you could there's, yeah there was a guy uh, one of my best friends through uh, college who um, he we we always took the same illustration classes together but instead of design he kind of steered it into advertising and now mm -hmm. he's working as a uh, at, I think it's uh, Adams outdoor uh, in Allentown so he's oh. he's been there for a long time he, he's they do a lot of billboard advertising mm -hmm. uh, on 22 in Allentown oh. um, and as far as networking uh, Dave Perillo and Scott Derby other PCS members while I didn't go to school with them we that was such like a, as close as I'll ever get to a bullpen when we all worked at a uh, what was basically a medical publishing firm, they did uh, probably 20 to 30 different uh, magazines, publications about different facets uh, and modalities in healthcare. And we were like the editorial at ed illustration staff of, hey, hey there's Scott. <laughs> um, yeah, th but those guys, like we, we really came up at the same time and it was, it's, that's, that's my network right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process. Um, uh, before we came on, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, Adobe Illustrator. And uh, I was wondering, if was there any points of time, and I don't want to jump too far ahead too quickly, but were there any <laughs> points of time where you were really leaning into one way of making that went to Illustrator later, or were you always an Illustrator guy? No, I wasn't always. I remember, a, a Martin Lemelman, one of my illustration professors, was always trying to, especially towards senior year, trying to get me to jump to Illustrator because I was doing a lot of cut paper, a lot of like flat cut paper illustrations, and he yeah. obviously could see the um, the the easy bridge to to Illustrator at that point, and it would have been infinitely editable instead of <laughs> cutting pieces of color tag and mm -hmm. rubber cementing them down. And um, it wasn't until probably that first job that I had, that design job where I really, I felt, I, I remember one of the first days there feeling weak in my illustrator skills. And um, I don't, I don't recall if there's a certain project that got me uh, like, got me like really into the, like a, a, a dedicated routine to learn it. But I, I was always coming up with projects that I wanted to, to just fun projects that as I worked through them, I, I kind of taught myself mm -hmm. how to be more proficient. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one other thing, well, I could talk about Illustrator all day because um, really I've always, and I've said this a lot, I felt like Illustrator was like a magic trick, <laughs> right? It's a, it's like a magic trick that not a lot of dudes know how to do or yeah. how to use, right? So yep. when you bust out like these amazing illustrations and people are like, how'd you do that? And then <laughs> it's like, oh, I did an illustrator. And you could open up Illustrator right now. You could get the Adobe sweet thing and open it up and just like stare at it. 
and never make anything look good. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. It's not. In, it's at, It feels intuitive to me now because right. I pretty much draw in there now. But uh, right. it, it took me a long time to get to get proficient. And it is intimidating when you first jump in. It's super yeah. intimidating. Yeah. The only other person I, that always pops to mind who used Illustrator really well was uh, Alberto Ruiz because he would look at stuff he did and he would like never think it was Illustrator. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it's such, and I wonder how many guys and gals out there use Illustrator. I don't know versus people who don't. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's such a very learned thing, and once you master it, it's like you've unlocked the secrets of the universe. Yeah. Right. It's funny too because people ask me, they're like, "Why don't you speak at Adobe Max?" Or, and I would love right, to right. if I ever get to, uh, get the opportunity. Right. And the, some people come to me with Illustrator questions, and I tell them, and I mean this completely. I probably know forty percent of the program. Yeah. There is it is so it's so expansive, and I don't even keep up on mm. updates because I know I use I have the set of tools that I know I I need. I don't yeah. I don't even it, maybe it's to my detriment, but I don't even I don't even explore the new tools, at least in a in a thorough way. Well, that's it, like, it's 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 so it's extensive. Well, yeah, that's people, like, yeah. go ahead. Mike. Yeah, I was going to say that there there were people that were like that with certain versions of Photoshop, and they were like, no, 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 I'm going to read. And then eventually they had to go from you know four to seven, <laughs> right. seven and they, then it's they, like, yeah, and because you figure out a way that really works for you, right, um, right. It's yeah. I think that speaks to using it as a tool and not letting it it do the do you know run your design it's 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 a means to get what's in my head uh out in i don't want to say on paper because into pixels mm -hmm, mm -hmm. out into the world into the world yeah yeah now now why illustrator and not clip studio paint <laughs> <laughs> i actually have never had the opportunity to mess around with Clip Studio Paint because um, it does the same thing. It does vectors and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and everything. And and um, my thing with illustrators, it always seemed like seemed very scientific and not very intuitive. Where you had to grab and things and points and yeah, you know. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I just a, uh, I just want to draw it. Yeah, I think that's the, uh, I think that's the learning curve that I've gotten over. That uh, I, I kind of think in that way now that. Maybe Clip Studio may be better uh, or or easier to jump into than Illustrator. The, mm. the learning curve may not be as as steep. Yeah, um, <clears throat> our good buddy Asa Taylor just says a lot of Z brush sculptors only use a handful of the hundred or so brushes, uh, which is a good point. And I wanted to kind of talk about the creative. I don't want to call it a curse, but there's like a thing where once you figure out how things work and they work for you, you don't mess with it. Yeah. Yep. There is definitely a, a, a fear of stepping outside of like, I, all right, I got this to work. I can figure it out. I got it. Like it does what I need it to do. I've never run into a situation where I can't get it to, to, to produce what I'm thinking, mm -hmm. but I know there's a whole world out there of other mediums and other programs. So mm -hmm. it, it is, there is definitely a fear. Uh, and I don't want to turn this into the Illustrator show, but I think it's a really, <laughs> it's a really interesting thing and because you're probably the first creative we've had on here that works extensively in in uh, Adobe Illustrator. So, you know, I have questions just about, you know, just the aesthetics of it all. But maybe you can show us some of your uh, some uh, some samples of your work, Tom. Uh, yeah, are, I will. There's some uh, some questions already in the room and I told them to sit on their hands <laughs> <laughs> until we get to this part. That's fine. Uh, so, you're, so can I share now? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, cool. So yeah, so uh, yeah, let us know what we're looking at, and okay, maybe so and this, I'll ask some questions through it. Go this ahead. is a. Uh, I'll start here because this is a. I have a before and after. This is a rough draft of an illustration of a poster, actually, screen printed poster that I did for um, a Disney show that I was in. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mondo posters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had a, a Disney themed show in Austin a few years back and they asked me to do a few pieces for it. It was a, um, may, they may have had 30 or 40 different artists contribute pieces. And this was, um, 
24 by 36 Alice in Wonderland that obviously based on a playing card design. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I turned in as a rough to kind of get approval. The way these things work, you turn a, a rough like this. Some some people turn in um, pencil sketch. Some people go this far. Uh, for me, it's it's worked well to, to show this level of, of completion. And then um, uh, from there, that's the final, which is obviously a lot tighter, but it still mm -hmm. retains most of the composition. Right. And as as the project evolved, uh, we'd got the cool idea to uh, they had the corners rounded on the um, on the screen print. After they were printed, they sent them to a, a die shop that rounded the corners. Wow! So it actually appeared as a twenty four by thirty six playing card, which would and then we did it, since it's a flipped image, uh, we were. It, we're going to drive collectors nuts trying to decide which way to hang it. And then, and then like to add another layer of craziness to it, we printed the back mm. uh, with it. We created a whole playing card design. So wow. I've, I, I've heard of people framing these in floating frames uh, between mm -hmm. two rooms so they can actually yeah. see them hanging. Oh, well, they can, they can just buy four of them. There. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there was another colorway. So it becomes eight different posters. I love it. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic! Um, uh, before we keep, before we go too far, uh, yep. I'm going to throw some some questions at you. Sure, go ahead. So, Tom T Dog from T Dog Studio says, "Tom, can you explain your relationships with Mondo and Gallery 88, etc.?" Yeah, sure. And that's that's funny that he lumped them together because I always put Gallery 88 and Mondo as like they they really gave me both of them gave me my big break to really open up my career. Mm. Um, I think it was 2009 gallery 88 does a show every year called crazy for cult where they ask you to um, basically take your, take, try your hand at creating a poster, a piece of art for a wide variety of pop culture movies. Mm -hmm. um, and they, in 2009, they invited me to, um, to be part of that show. And um, I did a piece for UHF with um, Weird Al, because he was yeah. supposed to be at, he was supposed to be at the opening. He wound up not being there, but they still asked for, for me to do that. Uh -huh. And uh, which he has the piece hanging in above his piano in his house. I've seen him um, do interviews before with the piece above his piano, and it's pretty cool. That's pretty and cool. Um, uh, and I did Army of Darkness. So from there on, I was asked to participate in shows. I've I've had solo shows and two man shows uh, at at that gallery, and then. Uh, not long after that, Mondo, who is for for those that don't know, they are the, the, the basically the pioneers and the leaders of the screen printed movie poster game. Mm -hmm. So um, they basically took what was going on in gig posters, where um, artists create images for bands and then have them screen printed and sold in a limited run, and they adapted that model to um, screen printed posters for movies and. TV properties, TV shows. Um, so they they got in touch with me probably either later 2009 or early 2010 and uh, asked me to do posters for Star Wars and Star Trek. So for, I've been working with both places since, and I always really, really credit both of them for really giving me a, a an audience and a, uh, a place to show my work. Mm, mm, mm. That's fantastic. Cool. Uh, thanks. All right, uh, keep going, Tom, and I'll and I'll load up another. All one. right, cool. Uh, let's see what else. So I, I've done some band work too. So these these kind of fall in the line of of the gig posters that I was talking about. This is not necessarily for a specific show, but this was done for uh, Rockabilly merch company um, for Anthrax, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorite bands. So that was a big deal for me. That's great. And then in the same vein uh, for Metallica for a show in 2019, this was a, a VIP poster that was given out, I guess, at a certain level of ticket. Um, uh, they gave these out to, to people who purchased a certain level of ticket. Did you uh, have any interaction with the bands themselves? Or would they give you any feedback or anything? No, it was – and a lot of the, the gig posters, it's pretty refreshing to work on. They Most – they the ones that have specific parameters will give you to give them to you up front. And uh, a lot of the time it's like no nudity, no political stuff, no guns yeah. other than just let it rip. 
and they they were there was no no back and forth on on these. Typically, the the music posters are pretty much as long as as long as they're cool with the image, they they'll let it go. But of course, now if you were doing one for Ted Nugent, it would be all the above. <laughs> be all all political, yeah, all pol <laughs> nothing nothing non political. That's right. And there's one for Jack White. This yeah. one, he he did have input on this one. And again, I'm not. Rarely do I get to interact directly with the artists. There's always somebody that's art directing or like a, right. the producer of the uh, in between. But uh, he specifically, he has a thing about the, these blue colors. Mm. Um, he, he's very color oriented, and especially with the uh, white stripes, which is all the red and white stuff. And then, I if I remember correctly, I, I even think. Um, he they dictated the PMS colors for these blues. So I think wow. this could be I think he had three different blues you could use. Um, so his whole run of posters done by different artists looked really cool together because they all had the same color scheme. Wow. And this was a show in Lithuania um, that this is the uh, a Lithuanian flag. And he wanted a lot of he, he was uh, for this album. There was a lot of uh, th like the, the three the three hash marks. So you can see it's on the shield. It's on the hilt of his sword. Yeah. It's on, it's on those um, ribbons hanging off the saddle. It's on the straps on his boots. So um, a lot of times the, this one, there's a little bit more input just because I think he likes to have a lot of control over uh, what his merch looks like. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And I was going to ask you some color questions, but uh, some of the people in the room have beat me to it. Uh, <laughs> my good buddies, Lee and Abby, uh, are checking in. And Abby has a question. Can Tom talk about his use of color in his work and his background in studying color? Uh, yeah, I, I, there's the question. I, I don't, I'm not belittling Lee at all. I don't want it to sound like I'm, cause, but I get this question every time. Um, on a podcast or I, I give a talk mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's totally valid. And I, I do not have a good answer on um, it. It really is a feeling to me, not with the, the Jack white, notwithstanding. I just kind of um, the way I create a palette in illustrator. Um, I will make four or five different colors and kind of depending on what the job calls for, how many colors the job is. And, um, I'm constantly editing those colors when I'm watching how they interact with each other for more contrast or less contrast or, but it's, it's, I'm always adding a little bit of cyan, a little bit of magenta the entire way through the process. Um, but it really is. And it sounds like such a lame answer and I hate giving it every time, but it really is just a feel. Um, it, it when it looks right to my eye, I, I kind of stop fiddling with the color. I, 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 you know, I can see that because I, 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 think that color is instinctual like we all every artist in goes to art school paints swatches right we mm -hmm. all paint everybody you know learns them and then you make the uh <clears throat> the tertiary colors and yep. oh, everybody you know then you do the the stipple we all learn how to mix the color optically right everybody goes through that but some people i think it's just like perfect pitch or yep. rhythm or you know, having an ear to pull out a tune. Some people just they have it, and other people they could take all those classes. They could read every book on color theory. They're just not, it's just not. I think I think that's the best explanation, and I may I may steal that for next time <laughs> I, I I get this question. Um, it's, it's that's the best explanation I've ever heard of it because I I actually I've been watching a. Um, as, as I'm working, I, I like to have really light stuff on. I, I used to watch, try to watch like series, like Netflix series. And I just, I don't have the bandwidth to like yeah. mentally like watch anything heavy anymore. So uh, while I'm working I, I, and so I've been watching these reaction videos where this classical composer reacts to like modern metal. And uh, he was listening to Iron Maiden songs that I've heard 500 times. And he's just picking out like rhythms and, drum fills and stuff like I've never heard that stuff but he he has the he has the tools to to kind of look at it that way and it, that may be kind of where where the color lies for me mm -hmm. yeah 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 I mean I, I I I imagine that I mean it's something that you can also 
strengthen if you have a natural instinct for it. Um, and um, I think it also has to do too with what you're exposed to as a kid. Like yeah. I realize now when I watch an old Warner Brothers cartoon that was done by Maurice Noble that I watched a bazillion times as a kid, that's like so deeply rooted in my head. Are there artists that you can think of now that you find that were like that, that were like foundational to you that really looking back on? I can't go back like to when I was a kid, kid. Uh, although I, I do have to say I went to Catholic school and I don't know why, but I, when I was exposed to artwork of uh, stained glass in the last few years, I was like, I think some of the illustrations in those old theology religion textbooks had some kind of deep, uh, I don't know if it was stained glass or it, it had some kind of deep impact on me because I, I feel like I see the stuff I do now, especially something like this poster. And uh, yeah. it just, it just reminds me of, of an old textbook illustration. As far as artists, I, I I can't think of any that go way back. I, I would say Mike Mignola, definitely. Um, I know I know so many people reference him, but just the way he his contrast is just killer to me. And I think that probably had a deeper impact than I realized when I was first exposed to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, sometimes talk about color, this co the color stuff and color theory and palettes and uh, with me, and I don't know if Mike has a color story, is I have a really warped perspective about color because I kind of learned it from doing graffiti. When I was a kid, <laughs> right? And my and your color theory came from what markers you had in the shoe box. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you make that orange and that purple work. Yeah, yeah. Because that's all you got left, right? That's right, all you got. right. <laughs> you know, and you can you can only mix them so far before you get brown. Right, right. You got to be careful. So it's all about control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, JRD has a question. This is a technical question. Uh, do you do everything in Illustrator, or like most artists, do you do the layouts in Illustrator, then color in Photoshop? Uh, everything in Illustrator, except if I need to do um, do a glow or any any kind of soft line, mm -hmm. I'll create I'll create that in Photoshop and then bring it into Illustrator. The reason is 90% of my work is screen printed. So I have to keep it uh, on some level bitmapped so that the screens of the, uh, of the screen printer can capture it. If it's a, if it's a true color fade, it's gonna, it's gonna send the screen printer haywire. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's, it's hundred percent Illustrator. And I, I prefer Illustrator to Photoshop because I can edit size and color just infinitely. Right. Um, not that you can't do that. You can't do, you can do color in Photoshop, mm -hmm. but um, as far as scaling, I'm always terrified of running out of scale mm -hmm. in, uh, in Photoshop. Yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the first uh, magic tricks. That's kind of like pulling the scarf out of your sleeve is, yeah. is, yeah. Uh, is scaling and just the whole reason that vectors work so well. Yeah. What what's the what's the biggest piece or what what's the biggest size you've ever had a piece reproduced? Like on a building or something or a billboard or hmm. the side of a building, the Peterson Art Museum in uh, or uh, Peterson Automotive Museum in uh, Los Angeles. They hired me to do a few exhibit posters. That and the, the place is on they've since since I was working for them, they've um, totally renovated their building and it's even more impressive now. But when it was a like a, a basically a concrete slab building before about 10 years ago. Um, they reproduced one of the um, uh, program covers that I did. It was probably, I'm guessing 10, 12 stories tall. Wow. That was, wow. that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Did you get yeah. a picture I, of yourself next to it for scale? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did. I happened to be, luckily I happened to be out at, it's only a few blocks away from gallery 88 and uh, happened to, it, the exhibition happened to be going on while I was out for a show. And uh, yeah, that was that was definitely a cool moment. Hmm. Uh, wow, they're they're pouring in, Tom. I hope this is a, is cool with you. Oh, I hope, yeah, yeah. Hope we're not distracting you with all these questions. Oh no, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> uh, our good buddy Asa asked, "Do you ever use gradient meshes for those kind of soft edges and transitions?" No, I. That's another. There's a tool that, like, when it came out, I messed with it for a little bit. I'm like, oh, that's cool, and I never, I've never gone back to it. 
And again, that's, I, I don't even know if you can, um, if, if you want to get in the weeds here, I don't know if, if you do a gradient mesh, if that's even separatable mm. um, at first grain print. Like, I think that it takes the colors and just kind of makes a million colors to make a nice smooth color, m nice smooth blend. Mm -hmm. And um, th th I think that's why I've kind of steered away from it. Yeah, uh, it's sort of what I call uh, dumb smart. It's like, I think <laughs> most people, like I know <laughs> studio, but I'm kind of dumb smart with it. Like I know how to do what I need to do really well. Right. And then you see these tutorials where people are doing all these other things. I'm like, well, that looks good, but I'll never have time to, <laughs> to, learn, <laughs> to learn how to do that because I'm sure yeah. – you don't want to learn how to do that on a job where it's like, you know, all of a sudden you've increased your, your time t twice because you like tried to do something like, Oh man, it's not working. And you got to start and, people on the phone and going, Hey man, uh, my whole thing just ate itself. What happened? Absolutely. And it that's again, probably to my detriment, I don't draw a lot for fun anymore. So it's all, and I don't have a problem with that. I have a lot of, I'm happy to have a lot of work right now. So I don't, I don't give myself a chance to experiment, especially on a live job for that exact reason. Like I don't want to get into the weeds and then have to explain, Hey, this isn't working. Can I have another week to, to basically restart? So yeah. Hmm. Uh, okay. Here's another one. Uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Our buddy D Brad, what up D Brad? D Brad asks, does Tom ever do any online demos of how he makes a poster? No, I haven't. I've done pieces and I've done as much as I could screen capture. I did a piece for Microsoft a few years ago, a poster mm -hmm. that they gave out at SDCC that they wanted me to capture process of, but it was just, it was portions of the poster. It wasn't a complete like front to back. Right. But that is, that is a valid uh, question because I think that would be valuable and enter entertaining to a degree if I could document every day that I work on a poster, maybe not, it, maybe not full, you know, live. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe people would like to see it live, but um, maybe it could be condensed down or sped up. Yeah. You have to speed it up. So it's like, blah, 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 yeah. blah, 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 done. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quick. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of the thing these days, right? Everybody is so uh, enthralled by like the stop motion animator, super quick thing where you just see the blur of hands and the little figure moving. People yeah. like that speed up, sped up stuff. But I think at some point that's got to go against the creative grain, right? Because it's like now it's like a show that you get to watch. It is not really you in the weeds at five in the morning. Exactly. Posing a th you know what I'm saying? Like yep. it's it's sexy when it's sped up. Exactly. You know? I asked this question. I asked this question on the podcast a while back. Yeah. Do do people prefer to watch the sped up version, like you see the typical sped up version you see on YouTube now? Yeah. Or do they want to actually see somebody in real time do something? Because I would imagine, like a poster like that. There's, I mean, mm. that's not an eight hour job, right? That's <laughs> exactly right. No. right? Right? right. So you can't even like come back three days later. We'll just keep the stream going, you know? Exactly. Right. How much, how, 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 how much do you need to see? Right. Like it may be like, it may be valuable to do pop-ins every day for an hour. I don't know if you, do you guys know cartoonist Kayfabe? Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, Ed and, Ed and Jim. Yeah. Yeah. I watch, I follow that a lot and I know uh, they do at least, I don't, I don't know if Jim does mm -hmm. as much as Ed, but he'll do like kind of, a pop in for a few hours as he's working. Mm -hmm. But then I feel like for me, that would get, uh, I'd feel like I'm on, on stage and may not, might not be as comfortable or as uh, focused as I, as I need to be like a college house where we can watch Tom. What's Tom <laughs> <doing> right now? <laughs> pick, up, pick up the phone. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, and I guess Tom, uh, I, I want to go through more of your slides. Yeah, sure. Please, please don't stop. But uh, how, this kind of goes into a teaching thing. Do you have any background in teaching? I don't. Uh, I've, I've, I used to, I, I'll give you the nutshell of this. I used to have a terrible fear of uh, getting in front of people. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. to the point where I was invited back to Kutztown. They had a, they have a great program uh, called return of the uh, CD grads where they have three people come back every year. And when I was there, it was like, 
one of my favorite days of the year because they'd have three people who were gone for a few years and came back and they tell what they did and they invited me to do it and it was always a, a goal of mine to to be part of one of those and i i just couldn't do it i woke up like in sweats mm. a couple of weeks before and i'm like i just i don't think i can do this and they they said that's cool how about you come and talk to a class one time and i said that that's fine let's mm -hmm. let's give that a shot and i did that and i loved it and then they invited me back they had me um do a solo presentation one night um uh, for, for a full auditorium of students and, and grads and stuff. And I loved it. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've gotten over that hump of, of um, mm -hmm. the stage fright thing. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. What was, what was your initial question? Mike? Well, uh, well, you know, like a, a lot of the things that are getting asked kind of lend themselves to you being able to not maybe uh, demo things, not necessarily teach them to someone. Oh, teaching. Yeah. Right. Um, but, yeah. Right. I do have, I always feel like I would very much enjoy teaching, but I also, I don't say this lightly. I have a lot going on right now that I'm very uh, thankful, again, thankful to be busy. So I think teaching, the way I look at it is is something I, I would do towards the end of my career or, or you know, a it's little hard. bit later on. Yeah, it I, is, would, I would. It is, it is tough. There have been days where I'm sure just like with Jamar, like, I couldn't go and teach my class because I had a deadline. Right. You know, right. Deadline, and you feel bad, but that's that's the reality. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or because, and, and you know, talking about TED Talks and all of this stuff where people ask creatives to kind of get on stage and dance when, you know, I'm sure most people are comfortable in their studio working. Well, right. And that's why I, think I kind of steered toward this profession because it's something I can I can create in my vacuum and yeah. kind of put it out there yeah and I, I it was definitely a uh, an adjustment for me to, to even podcasts like yeah. sometimes are, are nerve-wracking uh, not this one but uh, <laughs> but yeah I mean oh, that, just you wait <laughs> <laughs> we're only we're still in hour one that's right um, yeah so there's definitely I, I i would like to at some point take that I, on but I, I would think now just looking at something like this i would think that if you had a step-by-step -step, a visual step-by-step -step, it might be actually easier for people to follow along from the standpoint that you know when you're doing key commands and you're having to remember this and yeah. stroke this line and remember yeah. go back to your mask. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in this. And if you watched it, you're not going to catch, you're not going to yeah. catch that. You're, you're just, right. You're just simply not. You're right. Because you're watching, it's like watching a, 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 a trying to watch an entire series of a TV show and you're missing, like, you're not going to catch every, every line, every word. Right. Whereas if you have a, a breakdown of like a plot synopsis, it's, it's far more impactful. Now, were your initial sketches for say something like this? Yeah. Do you draw them by hand? Do you do a doodle? Do you draw in illustrator? Do you draw for it in this, Photoshop and then pull it? How do you, how for do this you start? One, for this one, um, I was actually on vacation, um, with, I, I take a trip to Notre Dame with my dad every year. And this job had a super tight deadline. This was actually three, um, if you can kind of see where the color breaks are, the stormtroopers and then Ray and, and Kylo. Mm -hmm. These were three collectible tickets that the um, Regal theaters gave out mm -hmm. each weekend, the first three weekends of this movie's release. So mm -hmm. they needed sketches quickly. And then once that was approved, um, they let me go to final. But I did these as a, as a, a rough pencil sketch while I was on the road and then uh, turn that in. And then um, that once it was approved for final, it was, it's probably about uh, roughly a week, six or seven days worth of, of full-time work to, to finish that. Cause I, one thing I will say, having done a little bit of star Wars myself, myself, these characters are not easy to draw. They're all very, very, intricate and they're yes. more intricate than you actually realize until you actually start drawing them <laughs> yeah and you fu start finding textures and you start finding cracks and seams and like oh my god yeah totally i agree i actually uh for the stormtroopers it was that was they were 
that design was released. Was, I think that was one of the few things that they showed before the movie. Mm -hmm. So the only available reference for them was the, the Hot Toys um, mm. figure, figure, which I wound up having to buy on eBay, which was, <laughs> it was a write-off. So it, it didn't kill me to do that. But uh, that was that's how I actually got the reference for them. And I just took some really close-ups. And I, that's a good example. There is just a ton of filigree on those mm -hmm. outfits that you see on screen for about three seconds. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the, the new Star Wars stuff is even more detailed than the original Star Wars. Totally, stuff, totally. You know? It's busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I wanted to ask Tom about uh, client work like this. Yeah, um, dealing with say a a, a a music artist versus like a huge Lucas, model, Lucas, like, Lucas. like Lucas Art, oh, yeah, film Disney. Right. Um, can you tell tell the good people a little bit about the the challenges that you have doing high end client work versus something a little smaller? They they like um, especially Disney. It's all about keeping their uh, intellectual properties, like keeping the core value of their IP. So they don't want you steering too far off. At least for the my experience, they don't like you steering too far off of the. Mm -hmm. uh, of the models, um, mm -hmm. which yeah. is good for me. I feel like at least I can get my visual flavor on there and keep their, like keep really true to their, to their characters. It's it's to me, it still feels like something I did. Like I have ownership of it yet. It's still, you know, I didn't, I didn't reinvent the wheel as far as character design, mm -hmm. but that's, that's a good example of um, yeah. like it, that's they're, they're drawn as they were. Hmm. Um, now, when you were working for Disney, I know that you have to get things, and same with, with Lucasfilm, you have to be approved. I know with Disney, back in the day when I would do kids' books or coloring books, if you did something, you would send it to Western Publishing, and then they would send it to Disney. And if you got that dent in Pooh's head wrong or whatever, yep. they would actually have a guy or a gal at Disney would go over it. Absolutely. Yep, they still do that, and that's I, I find that beneficial because instead of trying to verbally deliver that news through a chain of diff, you know, like like you said, back down through the train chain of command, I find that and they they have it's great because they have all of the um, they have all the talent there that worked on these movies that can just kind of quickly put an overlay on and, and yeah and send it right back to you. Hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, we're having a little bit of tech difficulty. Some of the people in the chat are saying that the Facebook feed keeps keeps uh, popping in and out. So you can head over to YouTube if you need to. But we're going to keep rolling, brother. Oh, nice. Misfits. That's, yeah, that was a um, – I, I had the benefit of doing a couple projects with them. They um, This was a, a re-release of a 50s uh, covers album that they did. And in the uh, – while I was working on this, they had me redesign their uh, Misfits Records logo, which is the imprint that they they press their records under. Mm. So this was really fun. I got to meet Jerry at uh, Comic Con mm -hmm. at New York a couple of years ago after I did this. Uh, I have so many questions for you, Tom. And just yeah, so go, go ahead. I'm just going to start throwing some stuff. Shoot, out. go. So tell me about your well back in the before times we actually yeah. <laughs> traveled. Tell me about your convention calendar. Do you f did you feel the need to go to shows just to I don't know to see your fan base? Did you do it to get out the house? Would you rather just stay home and work on projects? Like why why do cons? That's a great question. I used to do. I love going to them, and I love I uh, did Wizard Philly. That was the I think in two thousand four was the first time I yeah. ever uh, exhibited. I, I think, think I was, went. That was the last time it was good too. <laughs> yeah that wow what is what a shame what a what a down downhill slide that has become um but uh i went one year that was the first convention i had ever gone to and then uh my buddy pat mcmullen who was also in the pcs for for a while um we decided to put a little zine out mm -hmm. and uh alongside the zine we, we wanted to fill up the table because we only had one issue so I, I did these little like three by four cards of um just different pop culture stuff. And that's that's really, even before the Gallery 88 stuff, that's kind of where I got the taste of 
uh, you know, pop culture artwork and, and being able to, because the response to those was huge. And it continued every year. I'd do a couple more, do a couple more. And then I had a full portfolio. So at, at the time I was doing uh, Philly, uh, Pittsburgh was such a fun, great show back in the day, uh, Baltimore. And then I did Seattle one year. I did Emerald City. Probably the last year it was called Emerald City. Mm -hmm. And um, and we've Dave and I have been splitting a table. Dave Perillo been and I have been splitting a table at uh, New York for the last seven or eight, maybe nine years. And mm -hmm. um, that's that's really the only one I do now, just because of time. Because I have two kids, mm -hmm. and I just don't like to be away for like four or five days at a time. Mm -hmm. So I'd really put all my eggs in that basket, and and it. I feel like I can, if I do that one show, I can, I can hit most of the people that I would see. Um, like that, that's just my, I put all my emphasis on that show now. No, no, I, I, I'm interested to, to get your thoughts on how you noticed that producing the pop culture, because you're a little ahead of the curve with that. <laughs> right, um, yeah. Right. Yep. And how that started, how that resonates with people. And now those shows basically are pop. It's like the reverse. It's all pop culture. And comics is like, yeah, we put it on the ticket, but, you know. Really. I completely agree. I, I I, would, I don't consider myself a pioneer for it, but I, I definitely was doing it before those shows shifted to pop culture art. And I, always, I lament it now because I, I would – personally rather go maybe it's because i see this stuff all the time i would rather go look at comic art but um i mean how do you guys feel about the the shift I, I i haven't been to baltimore in a while but that one felt like it had stayed true to the roots a little bit more mm -hmm. but it, again i, I kind of lost touch with them too well mike mike you go first okay well i would say that i did shows up until around 2008 then I stopped for several years while I was in school, and then I started going back. I mean, I would still go to Baltimore, and yeah, Mark is—he wants to make a show where the artists come, yeah, and it's about the art, and it's still about comics, although he is slowly adding more pop culture because that's what that's what people are are into, and so yeah, you really now I see it as you have. Geek culture or general culture is now geek culture has become general culture. Yeah, yeah, right. Like when I was a, I've said this before. When I was a teenager, what is general culture now would be geek culture. If you like Harry Potter or Star Trek or Star Wars, nerd, geek, exactly. Yeah, but geeks have become mm -hmm. the the culture, right? At the same time, well, films of comics have become big readership in comics is going the opposite way so it's weird you get the kid who comes to the philly show who likes iron man and if you had a cool iron man poster he'd be all over it but if you showed him a piece of comic art he's like well, right mm -hmm. agreed and is there a fix for that is there a way to get the comics to be to be if not the the primary thing if to get them to be more more valued or more important than they are. I, 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 I have to, you'd have to spend millions. Disney yeah. and at and would have to decide that they wanted to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars right. to advertise comics like we do Coca-Cola to get people to go, oh, hey, comic books, those are cool. Mm -hmm. They're never going to do That's that. That's not going to happen. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, right, especially with the advent of how popular the MCU is. There's no reason to go back. That's going backwards. Exactly. Yeah. That's so that's where it's at right now. Mm -hmm. Like people love DuckTales. There will never be a DuckTales comic book that sells like a bajillion <laughs> copies because they can just make another cartoon yeah. or a game or, or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of what it is. But um, I remember back when um, it was kind of like the, the summer of swiping. Remember when that one guy uh, got... Uh, Oh yeah! Pulled out of the comic book conventions because they found he was forging people. Oh yeah, I remember that guy. I, if you said his name, I would totally remember. I it. think it was like I think it was Granito or something. Yeah, Rob Granito. Rob Granito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And it kind of it causes really big rift, which I thought was, <laughs> it was interesting in its own way to me. Now to me, uh, what I thought was interesting is that you saw that there was a chasm between the creator, the comic book fan who was like, oh, well, that's a, that's a Garcia Lopez. Don't you know that? Don't give that guy your money because he, he stole that from Garcia Lopez. <laughs> and then you have somebody who goes, ooh, Wonder Woman. How much is it? You know what I mean? And those Which is like 90% of people in a wizard show. is like, right, Wonder, really Woman. Is. Wonder Woman fighting Harry Potter. I want that. Right. And and, yep. and and I think my my stance changed where I went. I don't think there's anything wrong with either of those. Like the, the stealing is wrong. Yes. But you, you, you understand that there's two different fans. And now there's three because there's the MCU fan who only knows Gal Gadot or Gadot, however you say her name. <laughs> That's Wonder Woman. Wonder Lady. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I feel like if there's a way they could feed all of these birds in one hand, that's great. But I don't think one is going to, I don't think comics is going to win that out. That's just, yeah, I agree. Opinion. I agree. Yeah, I, I even think that on, I don't know. So you have an Instagram. I know in my Instagram, and I was talking about this the other day, I have three distinct audiences on my Instagram. I have guys like you. A little bit older, mm -hmm. between you and Jamar's age, mm -hmm. there were guys that read my comics. Now in their 40s, they're getting gray. Mm -hmm. They remember <laughs> Dark Hawk and Batman and all that yep. stuff. I just posted, yep. posted something tonight on Instagram like, oh, man, that was my first comic. Right? Then you have the people who like the pen and ink drawings that I do. Right, my own thing, right? Right, right. That's a completely different audience, much younger. Some of the older Marvel fans or DC fans like that, mm -hmm. that skews. There's a lot younger, and it's a different because it's not about comic books, right? And then my fine art paintings, which is a whole other audience. There is some crossover, but there's less. It's just like you walk into a comic book store. Most of them don't have a manga section. Because the guy who's coming to buy Captain America doesn't give a crap about Little Witch Academia or, mm. or whatever. So do you find, because you're doing pop culture, do you see the crossing of the streams of the audience? Does your audience, you track that at all? Do you get, you know? Uh, I don't see, I probably don't see as much separation as you do um, between, I, I, I see people who I, I kind of, kind of have a feel well maybe this came this guy came in from the the movie poster work and then this person found me through the 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 movie tickets the collectible movie tickets i did and then this person collects the enamel pins that i do but it, it's a little bit more uh, the base is a little bit not quite as separated as your as your crews are mm -hmm. yeah and well, go ahead mike go ahead. no i'm just saying do, do you because I know on Instagram, one of the interesting things about it is that you can track your audience and what's pop. Do you do any of that? Do you track? Do you I don't. I don't go deep into it. I just look. I kind of take a look once in a while just to see where it, things. And Instagram is so weird. It used to be like, I'm sure you've noticed this too, but it, there, I would just get hundreds of followers per month. And now it's like. Some days you lose followers. Like your net is the yeah exactly. They monet they're monetizing it, but uh, yeah I have like I, I've looked at uh, statistics on uh, the breakdown of the audience and it's like seventy five percent male and twenty five percent female. It's a lot from the UK and a lot from obviously Canada, United States. But it, I don't go too deep into it. But it is it is pretty fascinating when you when you start to look at it. Uh, so do you. Go ahead, Jamar. Go ahead. Oh, there's a really good uh, statement from uh, Robert Schull. Hey, Robert. Thanks for joining us. He says, the life cycle of a con goer is making the jump from the three for 20 prints. To, yeah. Yep. Yep. To solid higher dollar purchases. Yeah, that's, that's my buddy, Bob, who uh, he, he's a he's a friend and he helps us out at uh, New York Comic Con. Yeah. What up, Bob? But he's he's he knows that he's been behind the table with us uh, for many years. And yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true, because the people that used to buy those little prints now have have kind of matured into the, the poster, mm -hmm. like the screen prints now. Well, and I remember that transition as we would talk about this a little bit, like just walking the floor, being behind a table where you could see it went from 
there was like there was like a, a ash can phase. Then there was the yep. the, yep. the the do it yourself sketchbook phase. Then you know everybody standing around with their hands in their pockets. Oh, this is a print show. Everybody yep. just is here for prints. They don't want comics. Yep. You know. And then yep. and then it went to like you know handmade graphic novels. You know where'd you get this print? Look at the Matt Hornish. Look at that. <laughs> Look at the gloss on. Well, that. The, yeah, and then when everybody has prints, yeah, it's like there's like there's more pockets to grab your dollars before mm -hmm. they get to you. So it's like when you were doing it in 94, you're kind of ahead of the curve. But now probably every artist has prints now. Yeah, it, it's that's just and especially we, we there's a uh, the spot that they put us at New York is called the block, which is like vinyl, um, vinyl toys and uh, a lot of what I do. Mm -hmm. Screen printed posters and and pop art, mm -hmm. so it's a it. I think even the convention has recognized it and kind of corralled us in the same spot. And one other thing about say the the major shows, say like San Diego or New York Comic Con, um, there was one time it was probably like the last New York I went to, and was I tabling? Yeah, I think I was. And a friend of mine from Philly was like, "You're going to New York, right?" And I was like, "Yeah." Hey, can you go past this booth and get me this like five hundred dollar poster? <laughs> and I'll pay you later. And I was like, uh, all right. I know, <laughs> right? And it's like, like people are coming out with the like the big guns at shows like that because they know the collectors are going to right. come and get things from and there. and they know that if you're only doing a few shows, that's where they get you, and they know that there's a huge audience there, so your your chances are you're going to sell it at that show. Right. So, but, and also, Tom, like, now we're having this kind of tennis match here. What, <laughs> I, find, what I find really interesting at that is with items, because the, 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 the objects you make are, they're priced the way they should be priced, right? You're not doing three for 10. No. <laughs> you no. know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and I'm sure the people that are looking for that may come to you and, have you ever had anybody that went, whoa, well, why is this so expensive? Yeah, but it's it's normally, and I, I this sounds kind of condescending. It's it's a lot of time it's kids. It's like okay. people that don't know the scene and they're like, they'll, they'll look through and they're like, oh, I love this, whatever. Is this Transform. free? Is this free? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, and they'll they'll get to the point where they're, they're they found something they like that kind of speaks to them and they're they see the price and they're like 50 bucks for a poster i could get and I've, I've had people say this i could get this at spencer's for for six dollars and i'm like well you can get something something at spencer's for six dollars but it's and you know i get it it's yeah. all it's all perceived value so if you find that it appealing that it's a hand screen printed poster that's only limited to 150 and you're going to hang it on your wall and enjoy it every day then it's worth that to you to that kid, it wasn't worth it. Right. So. Right. So, so with that, and I'll, to get off the subject, yeah, <clears throat> I guess maybe earlier in your career, when you probably did a uh, maybe some more kind of like lower tier shows, would you bring kind of like a different price point of thing for your table? Like, would you bring some kind of like low, you know, low budget things, and or things just like postcards that people could take for your website, right? Or, right. Know. Like, do you have like a staggering scale of? Yeah, the, especially early on, those little prints I was talking about—they were like, I forget what they were. Honestly, they were may have been three dollars each, or like yeah, four for ten. And then as they started to move, I'd move up to eleven by fourteen prints for ten dollars, and then we were doing this crazy thing where we were actually bringing glass frames like mm -hmm. glass clip frames oh, to the show. Wow. Oh my God. We, we dropped and smashed so many of those stupid things, but people were buying them in the frames. We were like, we were buying out Michaels and AC Moore's for two months before a show wow. because people just wanted to walk out of there with the, with the full a frame, thing. with right. the frame thing ready to hang on the wall. It was, it was insane. We would carry Tupperware bins full of these glass and Which is heavy. It it's super heavy. heavy. It's super. I'll never forget the time Scott and Dave and I were walking through. Uh, we had a park far away from uh, Wizard World, and we were ca carrying grid walls through the gallery, uh, like literally through the, the Kmart, just on our shoulders and buckets and bins of these glass frames. It was that was like <laughs> the gorilla days. 
uh, uh, our buddy Smash Button says, in 2019, I saw the Spider-Verse print and bought it without hesitation. Oh, awesome. Thank you. That's a must purchase. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank uh, you. How, how uh, this might be a hard thing to measure, but uh, how much of your, maybe at cons, your, uh, your buyers are repeat offenders? I would say probably about 50%. Hmm. If I'm just using, and again, I haven't done anything other than New York in yeah. the last five years, and uh, probably fifty percent. I, I, I have a nice, and a, obviously last year was a complete whiff, and we'll see what happens this year. But um, it was nice to see those same people every year, and yeah. you really could count on seeing a, a really solid group of people every year. Mm -hmm. And then, and then a lot of a lot of them, I do a, a good bit uh, of business online. So last year. To supplement, I started it in January, obviously not knowing about COVID, right. but uh, I started doing workshop finds. So the stuff that I would bring to a convention, I'd put on Instagram and say, first one to email me gets it. And that I, I was doing that for basically through the fall until we moved. I'm going to start it up again soon. But that was a, as far as money goes, it was a good uh, supplement mm -hmm. that uh, took the place of a convention because it was it. I think people like the game of it, trying to trying to see something that's rare that hasn't that's been in the flat file for five or six years, and there's like maybe maybe I have three or four left, and I'm willing to let one go at a certain time. Mm -hmm. It kind of keeps it it keeps a good rapport with between me and and the people that mm -hmm. that are interested in in my work. So you almost have like a Disney vault, right? It's, like, it's there's one drawer that's like it is disney and it i've never thought of it like that but it really is the disney fault yeah right you better you, hurry got, your, up. you got your white gloves on when you're <laughs> yeah right <laughs> now this this image that you have um when you're trying to do say something specific like a likeness of somebody yes um do you get a photo of jeff goldblum from that do they provide you or is that you kind of like five, 50, 50 pictures and kind of they you know, rarely they rarely provide ref. The, the studios rarely provide reference. This one I had to find, and this was actually a cast and crew gift for the, for like the rap of Thor Ragnarok. So, I pitched I I pitched something else, and I honestly forget what I did the first time. But um, it I was working through someone at Marvel Studios, and they were working with Kevin Feige. And he wanted, he really had this, I, I did a Willy Wonka poster a few years ago where it's basically the same layout, but Gene Wilder is where uh, Jeff Goldblum is. And I guess I kept, it, I kept running up against, like, it just wasn't, the sketches just weren't hitting um, what they wanted. And then I guess it finally came back that Kevin Feige wanted basically the same poster, like a, a, a Willy Wonka uh, style kind of a lot of a lot of colors bright colors going on and uh, these got printed and uh, given like I said to everyone on for the cast and crew wow so how did you go about finding getting your reference for his face um, I just I, I believe I found I, I found a really good forward facing shot of him that that captured pretty much everything that I needed and then again just cross-referencing and and that that's one thing that takes me forever is to get get the likenesses, especially when when one's this front and center. So right. it just takes it takes a lot of like back and forth, and I'll put it underneath and build on top of it and throw it away, and then it doesn't look right, and I need more reference for how the cheekbones break, and it just it's a long process for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, because the the straight on view is the hardest view. The three quarter is the best. The best view, slightly three quarter. Um, yeah, because you start to get the that's the nose, like kind of melts into the face. At least my opinion that that's that's what throws me. And sometimes you realize why you never see an actor face on because their face is crooked. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so I find that interesting. So for for certain projects, you will get reference, and then for other projects. You have to do your own reference. Definitely. Here's the, here. I'll show you this too. This this comes out this week. Um, I just oh, did this awesome. for, for ACDC, oh, and I great. actually um, they're doing a thing now. Obviously, since there's no live shows right now, um, they I'm working with a company who 
partners with bands and they're letting, uh, at least ACDC is letting us go back and pick a concert from the past, from their past history and kind of do a, do a specific, almost as if a gig poster for that show, mm -hmm. like retroactively a gig poster. So right. I did the Philly show and kind of tied in, uh, that's the date was the first time Back in Black was played in Philly and Hell's Bells was played in Philly. So the Liberty Bell tie in, but the, Angus likeness, I found a really good profile view, but he was, it was from maybe 10 years ago. So I had to go in and get the basic features down and then kind of make him change the hair and the, the neck shape and just kind of make him look as he did, would have looked back then. Yeah. Cause but, I, I it, it's, it's always, and then do you have to get the actor or the, the person to sign off on the likeness because I know sometimes you do. They have that in their contract. That yeah, like even on the Star Trek comic books, you would have to get you know Jean Luc Picard. It would have to go. Yeah, that's yep. my head. Yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, he he and his wife are actually the um, they as I found out recently they handle all their own approvals and uh, for merch and stuff. So yeah, all, all this stuff had to go through them. And most, like, pretty much everything with a, uh, anything with an actor face had to, that I that I do for any application has to get approved by the actor or actress. Mm. So, Tom, my, my uh, question of the night, or I have many questions of the night, <laughs> is one thing that I, I, I've loved about illustrator artists is I think there's, beyond just having a technical mastery of this application, it's, I think you have also have to have a certain mindset that you want to keep pulling lines or pushing lines or yep. making it a little bit or making it a little bit. How do you, right. Yep. How, yep. how do you, and this is like a, a rookie question, how do you know when to stop? That it probably I'm going to give the same answer as the color. It yeah. just it is such a feeling thing. Like right. to yeah. like for example on this to figure out how far to pull that guitar neck out yeah. of the of the arch, and it felt good when it got between those two yeah. those two tabs yeah. and and the, the lightning I fiddled with forever. Yeah, like it just just to get it to feel like it fe everything and and again it's it's for me it's composition. Composition yeah. is king. So just to get everything, like there's no tangents, they're nothing. And it's probably way different than what you guys, you guys like move so much faster. Um, like it, you, I'm, you have different challenges in your work, but it's like, it, and that's what scares me about traditional media mm -hmm. going back to it now. Cause I, I fiddle with stuff forever and make it like what looks to me perfect. But I can't imagine how, like it feels to me like a loss of control doing what you do and it, but yet it looks beautiful. I, I, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Each and each medium, I think we sort of seek that medium because it, it resonates with us. Like, I don't think I would ever be a great illustrator person, even if I really learned to mm -hmm. work the program, because I don't think that that's, I wouldn't feel it in the way that you do. Yeah. You know, yep. um, it's just like uh, if you started out, maybe if I started out maybe with digital, but I didn't. You know, I right. had thirty years, over thirty years of learning to draw and my career before I ever started doing anything digital. So, um, you know, uh, but yeah, but the same thing. You know, tangents. I mean, how many hours are just in that guitar? Guitars are difficult to draw. They're incredibly difficult, and to get the spacing on the fret bars right. Oh and, yeah. And then this is even fudged because, like, speaking to Jamar's point, I, I extended that neck just a hair to get it to come out where I wanted it to. And I, I'm there may be guitar people out there who can see that, but I, I hope the the fudging I do is is almost invisible. They were like, "What?" They see that post on the wall. That's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <Forget it. laughs> yeah. There's a, a, a there's a well. We had this weird kind of like Highlander blip that happened on Facebook. Now all these questions just popped up out of the blue. Uh, Tom Happy Paper is a great name. Says Tom, what, <laughs> what's your research idea slash idea generation process when you're approaching a new poster project? 
like so, yeah like how were you kind of putting things together before you go to the boards so typically i will know i have a again i'm thankful to have a, a nice uh slate of stuff coming up so i know going for the next two three months uh even uh, especially on posters what i'm what i have you know ahead of me so i'll always try to watch that um movie or tv show or just have have it on in the background at least while i'm working on current stuff just so i'm immersed in it a little bit um typically what i'll do is if there's at this point i i get almost to a point where i can just hack out a rough in illustrator without a, a pencil sketch mm -hmm. um I, rarely does a client get a pencil sketch from me um there's times when i, I do it in the sketchbook just to prove what's in my head is going to work in in real life mm -hmm. um, and then really it is once i can it, it, if i feel the composition is is in place on the sketch then after that i feel like the, the rendering is the fun part to me and it, typically on a poster it takes a, a day or two for me to get a a, a really tight composition or sketch down mm -hmm. and then especially i would say on a movie poster something like um Well, this this is maybe an extreme example, but uh, wow, yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, that probably took two to three days to get the sketch together, just to get everything to fit right. Right. And then the final, the final on this may have taken, I don't know, a better part of maybe eight to ten days to, just to get everything rendered. And so my my brain wants to think that you kind of design each one of these guys and then start you start kind of like placing them in front or in back or front or back and back in front of each other or is it just one mass of an illustration it's it's pretty much one mass at wow. least i i just need to know where everybody's going to fit and there's yeah. obviously there's obviously the things that are going to change on the fly but yeah. if i know cap is front and center and he's flanked by a side view wolverine and cyclops and Deadpool and Venom kind of snake up the, through the top. I can I can show that on a sketch and then start working and mm -hmm. then kind of fiddle with the others. Like it, once you get past the meat, the into the smaller characters, they can start moving around and mm -hmm. like the, the anybody that's contained in a shape is obviously a little bit more editable than right. the main image. But it, it really does. It happens. And I don't render each character and then walk away from it. Mm -hmm. I used to try to do that, and I find it better to maybe mm -hmm. get Deadpool's body done and then not work on his arm yet because you don't know exactly where it's going to land. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very analytical way of approaching it. I, I don't. It's probably different than what you guys how you guys approach uh, a like a, a jam piece like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, right. And this goes right into this. Uh, Sydney uh, Zeigler asks, "How long did it does it take you to do a piece like the ACDC one, or you know, even this one?" Yeah, typically, like I said, about a about a day or two to do the 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 sketch. Mm -hmm. ACDC probably happened a little quicker because I that was the second stab at it. They didn't like the first one, mm -hmm. um, so. But rendering wise, I would say I think that I just finished that this week so that took about four and a half days to finish and when wow. i say that i work i typically start work at about nine mm -hmm. and then i'm done at 3 30 and then i kind of since the kids are home i'm helping with lunch and stuff yeah. and then i when i say a day it's not like not cut and dry you guys know that yeah, yeah. Um, it, i'll come after they go back to bed i'll sit down here from like 10 to 2 and then you know that a day is really two shifts for me Mm. All the all the shifts. Yes, there is, <laughs> so, there is no time off. So, so you, better, yeah. you better enjoy it because there's yeah. no time off. Yeah. Now I know from working with Disney that often when you're working for somebody like them, they want everything on a layer because then they want to be able to take that Captain America head and put it on a you know something yep. else. So yep, mm -hmm. yep. And typically, that's that's kind of where I'm like. That's sometimes when I hear that, I'm like, oh, because as far as I, I'm concerned, once I get past this, this, uh, you know, the shield, I'm done. 
I don't. There's no other arm back there. There's no leg. <laughs> Same with Deadpool. There's no other arm. I, and sometimes they. I, I did a Toy Story piece uh, yeah. a couple of years ago, and they wanted the entire body of everybody drawn, even though it was a composition like this, where it was you know just pieces. I was like, and it just you you in. I don't know if they ever used all the pieces, if they ever pulled it apart, but it just exponentially increases the amount yeah. of work. Yeah, in Yugoslavia, they did some bed space. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and so how many, how many, let's get a little technical, how many layers is something like this? And well, what's the file size or your your rig setup? Because as, now I know Vector is not as much, is not as it's big. It's not as, as intense, as a, but like, I'm is a Photoshop file would be huge. I'm prepared for that question. So let me, uh, <laughs> let me, I'm going to screen share my, the window for a magic, the gathering poster. I did. Okay. For, forgive me if I blip out here. No, you're good. And why gonna... you, yeah, go ahead. While you're doing that, I'm going to talk to the people, uh, guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight. We're uh, interviewing Tom Whalen, uh, doing business as strong stuff. <laughs> LLC, Strong Stuff LLC. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Strong Stuff LLC. <laughs> the brand is strong. Um, if you guys have any questions for Tom, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if you uh, got bounced out of Facebook, we're back. Uh, you should be able to see the whole thing on our YouTube replay. <clears throat> All right, Tom. All right. So, can you see that uh, yeah. MTG poster? So, this was a um, project for it was three posters that. Uh, I don't know much about Magic the Gathering, so mm -hmm. forgive my ignorance here. But uh, this was a new, uh, this was a poster that had to feature uh, all their 36 planeswalkers that were in their current version of the game. And this was split into three 24 by 36 posters that they sent out to um, uh, all like game shops and comic book shops. So it was like a promotion that they, when they were launching a new phase of the game. But I think mm -hmm. this, is probably my record for uh, as far as how many layers it has. Wow. So there's 145 layers in here. Whoa. <laughs> no, do you group them? Like, do you yeah. put them in folders? And I don't. Uh, I try to color code them as far as um, I think that actually this is from an older version of Illustrator, so it screwed up my color uh, layering. Mm. Um, but uh, there's the wireframe. Wow. And it's 145 layers. So, like, for example, I can. If <laughs> That's for you. Yeah, you're you're, uh, you're, uh, you're oh uh, some kind of sorcerer or something. That doesn't look, that doesn't even look like re something real. That's like a matrix. <laughs> so, like, for these little characters, I think since they pop out of the frames, I put each, like, head, each character's head on one layer each character's body on another mm -hmm. it this one got and this let me look at the file size on this that's bananas this one even to me started feeling like really boggy this is only 5.6 megs wow yeah <laughs> that's crazy i feel like i shouldn't even see this it's it's ruining the magic <laughs> that's right close it close the door <laughs> avert, your, avert your eyes <laughs> wow so tom let me ask a question while you're going through this how do you visually keep yourself from going insane do you work in tiny sections of a yeah. of, of an image like this do you like tackle like a head in, in an afternoon and then you go back to something else yeah exactly i it it would drive me nuts if I if I didn't do it that way. And I'll I'll, I'll get a head done, and then I'll bounce over to work on a different head, and then I'll get some of the composition done and do a full body character. Th this even those full body characters, the the ones that are head to toe, that that took the better part of a day to do each one of those. So th this was a long. This took months of like from start to finish. It wasn't months of nonstop working, but right. Uh, it, there was a, pr a a pretty good amount of time. I mean, what, do, what do you what do you do for um, stress and eyewear? And I mean, when you work on something, I mean, <laughs> when I draw in the meat, what I call the meat world, the real world, the meat world, you know, I might put in a twelve and sometimes a fourteen hour, and then sometimes I've done a couple days in a row. 
um, and I'll get tired, you know. Yeah. But yeah. when I work all day on the computer screen, it just beats the shit out of my eyes. I don't. Luckily, I don't have that yet. But I noticed, like the last time I was at the the uh, eye doctor, it uh, my prescription slipped, and I'm I'm wondering if and I had been stable for years, so I don't know if um if I'm on the downward slope now. But I don't you wear have, the blue the blue blocker glasses. No, I don't. My my wife and my daughter have them, so I'm wondering if if I need to get a pair of those too. Tom needs those yellow sniper gl glasses. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny because the uh, the optometrist said to me, he said, you're fine with the prescription you have, but I think you, you probably want something stronger, don't you? I said, yeah. He's like, he understood that I needed to like have like almost like laser. Yeah. 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 Like laser focus. And he said, all right, I understand. And it, it's, he he got what I was trying to trying to to grasp for. So even with that, Tom, this is a that's an interesting uh, uh, side. Um, do you do you zoom in like a lot a lot? Do you zoom away? Like what 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 is your kind of like percentage that you're working at on the screen normally? Something like this where you just need to have a, a big yeah. like a. a, a overarching picture of it I'll, I'll zoom in and do all the fine work probably like at that size mm -hmm. and then i'll continually keep bouncing out to uh like whatever whatever it takes to fill the screen and just keep working at it and right. tweaking it well you're probably also at that age where and once you go over 40 if you do this for a living you're probably eventually going to need glasses and yeah, I can't you're, imagine you're not you're, reading it. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, one of the things that Dick Giordano told me in the very beginning that he would, every 15 minutes, he would look away at something very far away. Mm. Uh -huh. Because what happens is your eye loses the elasticity, mm -hmm. right? And everybody's different. Some people lose it sooner, some people, but everybody I know eventually wears if you're doing this you're focusing like what is like 18 inches 20 inches yep. from your screen mm -hmm. right that's how when i went to the optometrist to get my new glasses i had to put something and i said this is where I, this is where i'm looking right so that she would see where my eye was focusing yeah and because i so these are just these are not bifocals these are focused right for here because I had trifocals uh -huh. and they gave me migraines because my eye, because they were so powerful to be able to see far and close, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because my, when my son went in for his eye exam a couple of weeks ago, she said that to him, she told him to step away because he's on so much screens now because of school being remote. Yeah. Um, she said to stop every so often and just focus on something else. Just, Get your eyes away. And I listened to it, and I told him to listen to that advice, and I haven't done it. <laughs> I still haven't done it. So it's it's probably – that was probably more for me than for him. How big is your monitor, is your, your rig that you're working with? Uh, it's an iMac, I think, a 27. Mm -hmm. It's, the, it's the, the largest one they make. So you don't work on a Cintiq? No. No, it's all mouse. I do all mouse. Yeah, wow, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Again, yeah, I don't, I don't, I guess you really couldn't work with a, with a digital stylus in this it, way, could you? Yeah, I don't, I guess I've never done it. I had one at the, uh, the medical place that I was at and I, I took one because they offered them. They had a stack of them. I'm like, yeah, I'll take one. And I used it very, very infrequently. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I, I think after using that mouse for so long, I, I just have more, I feel like I have more control over the, the curves. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know, just knowing how Illustrator works. It's, I guess, it would be a precision in a different way. Yeah. Right. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I hear Cosmo. Huh. <laughs> so, so you have never tried working, uh, doing one of these with uh, Cintiq, or no? Yeah, no. So you're working here and then looking up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Actually, no. I don't look. I don't. I don't look. I kind of just stare, just stare at the screen. I'm not, I can, I'm not focused on the hand at all or okay. on anything. 
Okay. No, no. Do you, is your, is your, your, do you stay updated with the tech? Like with there, like every six months they're always putting on a new version of, or do you say, no, I'm staying with, you know, uh, I'm, Illustrator 12 and. Yep. Well, I, I held out as long as I could, whatever the last version was that, um, that you could like buy outright uh, before they went to the cloud. I, I used that as long as I could until I, my uh, computer just quit. It just died. And then I had to upgrade to a new operating system and it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it, wouldn't work anymore. So I, I, I'll update, but I'm not like, I don't, I'm not crazy about it. I'll update when I have to, but it's not, I'm, I'm like, I, I have a comfort level of where my workspace now. Right. Now, now you've got, you know, a, a pretty good career going. Do you, do you, are you in a position where you can sort of like, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> or yes, I'd rather do this. Yeah. At the, I still try to take like 99% of the jobs that come my way, but this, uh, there's still stuff that comes through that I'm like, and I, I really have to balance like the opportunity it provides for me, right. even if it's not exactly what I want to be doing. But again, I, I feel fortunate to 99% of the stuff that comes my way is stuff I genuinely want to do. So you, there is, I do definitely have the ability to, to turn some stuff down if I don't, if I'm not inspired by it. And I, I'm, pr I'm pretty open about like, I'm just not into doing that or I don't think that's a best, the best fit for me. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, I think, and I, I've said this to some of our uh, contemporaries and you know, like we're all kind of, between Tom and I, we're all kind of like in the same age bracket. And it's weird to think that, you could take this any, any way, that we're kind of the, the guys now, so to yeah. speak. Right. There's like people who are like, you know, the old guard of people above us. And then there's everybody else trying to get in. <laughs> yeah, it's it, you're absolutely true. And I, I, I hesitate to look at myself like this, but there's people that come up to me at a convention yeah. and they will talk to me like I remember thinking about those comic artists that I loved when I grew up. And yeah. I have to I continually remind myself of that, that it's not that's you know, nothing to be taken lightly. I, I, I really do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's strange in its own way. And that's it's super strange. Yeah. <laughs> and that's something I talked to Mike about once in a while, because we even all of us come in the trap door different ways to get yep. into the industry. Um, so you know what, we're, we're starting to wrap up, Tom, you've been fantastic. Uh, I hope you. I hope you haven't been holding in a pee or anything like. No, that. I'm not. I'm actually, I am. I'm terrible at that, but I'm doing really well right now. So I think Dude. I can make another <laughs> another 18 minutes easy. Uh, oh, that's, that's do great. you do you have any advice for the budding the budding Waylands of the world? Yeah, it, that's yeah, that's a good question too. A lot of a lot of uh, it seems to be that there's a project that a lot of college professors give to their students to seek out an artist and kind of do a project in their style and then contact the artist and show it to them. And that just, it bugs me. And I, I just, mm -hmm. I wish I understand. And I know I was on that side of it, but I don't mind people doing something <laughs> in a style that's not theirs if they're doing it to learn, but if you're going to do it, and then just make find your own voice. Is is look what I did? It looks like you. You like it? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. hire me? <laughs> exactly. It's it's a tough question because I don't. I look at it and I can. I used to try to give like just baseline compliments about it as much as I could find positive, but um, I now I try to steer them to like, all right, take what you learned out of this and apply it to something, and and find your own voice. So, mm -hmm. draw this in your style. Draw this in the Wayland style. Yeah, you know, you see, yeah. you see a lot of that of people. And, mm -hmm. the, and the other thing is, every spring you probably get it. All these people contact you because this, the professors say you have to go find a mentor. You have yep. to go find a professional artist mm -hmm. and get them to like make you the Padawan. You know, yes. the, uh, yep. 
the you know you have to be you know, and then they all get evil and you have to cut their legs off. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> On a lava flow, you know, I hate you. every year. You know? I hate no and and the thing that really irks me about that is I used to answer everyone and I used to like give as much advice as I could. And I bet you 30% of the people ever came back and said, thank you. Oh, and oh, it's, yeah. it, it's not about that coming back to me, but it, it's, it always just feels like they're doing an assignment. And then I stopped, I just stopped doing And I, I, I now I say, I just, I'm sorry. I don't do that. Um, I don't participate in that anymore. Yeah, there was a there was a, a little bit of blowback on Twitter a while ago where a couple of creators were saying, you know what, I feel bad for you students, but to, will you please tell your teachers to stop sending you guys to me? You know, cold, yeah. cold, because cold. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just like this cold. Hey, I'm yeah. doing an assignment and I choose you, Pikachu. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's like it's like. Can I ask you? There's a big difference between someone saying, "I have this assignment." Can I ask you a few questions? Let me know. Other than, and then there are people that I've literally had one who said it was due the next day, <laughs> and then sent me a list of like twenty questions. I was yeah. like, dude, that's there. Here's a life lesson that anything you learn from this, from your from from, you know, getting a, a poor grade or whatever, is going to be way more valuable than what any information I can give you because you're obviously not interested enough if you're only contacting me the night before. Yeah. I, I sort of think it's a lazy teacher assignment to say, I do too. Go find an artist and then ask them um, because most students don't know enough about it. So then they're like, Oh, who, who do I find? Who right. and they don't really know anything about you or very little bit about you. And they don't really know what they should even ask you. Yeah. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. so so for those who are a little bit further down the road, maybe not quite the beginner. Yeah. What kind of advice would you because I just had a little bit of a Twitter thing today uh, talking about like rates, things like that. That is something that a lot of young artists have no idea. Somebody oh, will That's contact cool. them on Instagram like their work and go, I want you to do a book. Uh, and you, by the time you work it a lot, it's like thirty dollars an image, full color, fifty-two yeah. of them. I need it in a month. You know mm -hmm. that is if if I ever teach a class, that is there's definitely going to be a component of that in there, or it's going to be that's going to be the whole class about how to, the business of of art. Um, there's there's such nuanced conversation, and even doing this, I've been solo freelance for seven years now. And uh, it's it's still a mystery. Some of it is still a mystery. Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, Dave Perillo and I co constantly call each other and be like, "Here's the situation. Here's what I'm thinking. Does this sound good to you? Or here's the situation. I have a number in my head. You tell me what you. It, it is such a. And then on top of that, the invoicing and promotion and social media is just it's overwhelming. But as far as art goes, I would say, don't ever be afraid to. Uh, you can never have too much exposure to if you, if you're doing strictly comic work, like as what we said before, don't be afraid to expose yourself to typography, letter forms, uh, graphic design, because there's so much value in all of those visual disciplines that I personally, I love putting them all together and it may not be a passion for everyone, but um, I just think you, you can find inspiration and a lot of, um, value in different disciplines and comics i think are like we said before too are terribly undervalued in uh, as far as like an art medium especially yes. especially in a lot of schools i think mm -hmm. so there's well, just well, so it's much funny. like when you were in school there probably weren't courses on graphic novel no no and now every school has courses on graphic novels and i just say they're comics right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but you can't yeah. say comics because you can't charge as much money. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say graphic novel. Yeah, I like, I like the way you said that graphic novel. Pinky <laughs> uh, out. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I so, have. Oh, go ahead, Mike. And then I'll I was gonna. I was just gonna say. So, do you have a? Okay. Do you break it down to hourly or per? Project? No. 
project. That's, sure. that's the other thing. You get questions. Like people go like, okay. How do you charge? Is it $40 an hour, $50 an hour? You know, or is it per project? Like flat it's, rate? I, I do it on project. And again, I, I've been, I've had the benefit of doing this for seven years now, or even like prior than that, I, I, I was doing this just not full time. So I know kind of like, all right, I can do this in three days and I can charge. There is a roughly day rate that I can figure out, but I kind of, and here's another conversation too. I, I like when you say a number to the client, to the, to a client and they say, can we do a little bit less? Cause you know, you've hit the ceiling. If you say, if you give them a number and they're like, Oh, that's great. And you're like, I left <laughs> money on the table. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole, that's a whole shell game too. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, as far as I, I always charge project rates, unless and then I I'll, I'll tack on an hourly rate if there's excessive changes. That, that's usually how I word my contracts. Now, do you do you uh, or do, have you? Because I, I advise someone to this because especially for the young person, they'll come up and and the client prospective client will say, "I want you to do this project. How much would you charge?" Right. And I say, "Yes." You should say how much can you pay? That's exactly yeah, exactly right. You have to. They're fishing, and like I said, you you want to hit the ceiling and have them push you back down a little bit. You have to. Yeah, that's such an open ended trap question. That, mm -hmm. And but but the, the 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 defense to that is to say to go high. But again, if you're young and you're just starting out, you're afraid to lose the job. Right. You have to have a job. So it it is it is really a. A shell game. Yeah, because we yeah. know Disney's got deep pockets, but they're all <laughs> cheap. But they're also cheap. They're they're you know yeah they're, they're tough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I you know I just forgot the name. I used this used to be the Bible. Uh, what was it? The standard practices book. Remember oh, that? What the, is that? The um. It was yeah, like commercial art. art. Yeah, it was a commercial art. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. You I know used what I'm to, talking about. I used to I, a guy at work had one. I used to borrow it all the time. It was it, like, it was like a Bible of, and it was updated every like maybe year, and it had like pr all these pers like if you're working in the soda industry, this is what you can get for a, a full right. page ad. Yeah, yeah. Right. I forget. It was kind of like the pricing guide, or not the yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what it was. Yeah. It was a pricing guide. This is what a cover for Newsweek should be. This is exactly. What and, this is what a black and white storyboard would be this is yep. what a black and white story would be for national campaign right exactly right. Yeah, for, right. A, for like a bus shelter campaign two-year usage or unlimited usage yeah right. that's another is, yeah is yeah. it a buyout so the stuff you're doing for lucas or for regal or whatever that's a buyout so that's a different price right yeah yeah mm -hmm. i and i don't even i just always i always assume it's a buyout and it's a, it's a full time like they have usage. The only thing I ever ask for up front is, you can have it, do whatever you want with it, put it on a t shirt, put it whatever. Can I just put it on my social media and show it as mine? And that's generally I, there's may have been one or two times where they didn't want. Sometimes Disney doesn't like to show that someone outside of Florida or Hollywood is doing work for them but generally the, the the divisions that i've dealt with have been fine with me showing the work as mine and well disney and, drew it he drew it right right <laughs> right well tom this goes into a question uh that we we talked about a little earlier when um uh we, we talked about uh, strong stuff llc right yeah uh t-dog asks is LLC important when dealing with fan art? So maybe you being incorporated, does that is I mean, is that a legal necessity for the work? No, that you do? no, that was totally for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I that's there's another part of the business conversation. My wife said, "I think it's time to get an accountant," and I was like, "Oh my god!" All I heard was expense, monthly it's, expense. It's time. And, uh, it's it's been the guy that I have has been so good about like. Um, by incorporating, it puts me in a different tax bracket and um, allows me to write stuff off. And it, it's it's purely tax purposes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was the Graphic Artist Guild. That's what it was. Yeah, the Graphic yeah. Artist Guild. They yeah. get pricing guy. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to start wrapping this up. I have a couple more quick lightning round questions for all you. All right, good. Then we'll let you go. 
Uh, your boy Bob comes in with another good one. What kind of really out there projects or properties would Tom be interested in? Oh man, Bob, like, Bob, Bob. Like holy grails or random stuff that would be on the table if given carte blanche. That's the if you if money wasn't an object. <laughs> I, I, I this always used to go to a stock answer, which was uh, all the Godzilla movies. But I've mm -hmm. gotten recently to be able to do a good bit of them uh, through Mondo through posters for them. So. I would say I I don't know I have this itch to do stuff for Nike because I, I I just love what their you know their visuals have always been striking to me. Um, as far as properties, movies, uh, Thundercats is something I haven't touched yet. And mm. being a kid, being a kid of the '80s, I've like hit all of the um, the major properties in the '80s so far, like uh, mm -hmm. Transformers, GI Joe. Yeah. Um, so Thundercats would definitely be. So you want a Mumra poster? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I I used to say to Mike, he has to be sick of all of us because all we talk about is GI Joe and Ghostbusters. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, it's funny because I saw that stuff because my brother Mark is your age, yeah, and I would watch, you know, I, I like animation. I would watch cartoons. I was never as much into GI Joe. I probably watched actually watched Thundercats more than GI Joes. Mm -hmm. My GI Joes were different. My yeah, you had the yeah, yeah right. You had the right. Uh, Grips, right? So I don't know, like you know, Roadhouse and Shadow <laughs> and you know, Mystery Fist. I don't know. All those guys. I like Outhouse. Yeah, that Outhouse. Was, yeah, this that sounds was, like a this is like a spinoff podcast possibility here. This, this, I like this. I like I like I like GI Joe through Mike's eyes. Uh, yeah. out, outhouse yeah. is the latrine. That's uh, right. Guy. That's right. <laughs> All right. Here's a here's our last question for you, Tom. This is we had a great time with you tonight, bro. Uh, our buddy JRD asked Tom, "When are we going to see an art of strong stuff coffee table book oh, collecting man, your just, work?" I just had this conversation last week with somebody I'm working with. Um, the challenge of this is I've done a lot of work for a lot of different companies. So to get it licensed yeah. through all those companies, and I would never put out a book that just, I would never take my files and just make a book because I, I wouldn't want to burn all the bridges that I've built over the last however many years, but I would love to do this. I know it's a, it's a, it's a project, but uh, it's the challenge of, and it's a challenge that I've never explored actually actually trying to go and do the legwork of it it just seems daunting to me to get the rights to produce yeah to reproduce all that's, of that. what, I, that's what a yeah. good publisher would do yeah they that's, would that's, have the contacts with all the various people and they would be able to work work that because i went through some of that trying to do a book on storyboards and it was the same thing you can't get to get Disney and Marvel and DC and you know you got to get all these people's yeah. estates. Yeah, absolutely. You know? There's absolutely there's the, all the likenesses I've done. I'm sure they would have to have some kind of say. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure I'm sure there'd be a certain portion that would just automatic of of my work that would automatically be mm -hmm. null and void. Like I'm sure some stuff just isn't going to fly. So it it's a lot of work. I would love to do it, but it's a lot of work. Oh, let, oh, here's a new question that just popped up, and this will be sure. our last one. Uh, Mayra Valise says, hello, Tom, new to your work, but I'm glad I found you, smiley face. Question, are there any classes in college that you wish you had taken? Thank you for that question. Ah, oh, that's good. Uh, I wish there had been, like we said, uh, some kind of business class. I, I, I would say business classes of just how to manage what I'm doing now, the, the paperwork side of it. Um, as far as actual art goes, I would... I would love to probably go back and do watercolor and, and just kind of really get my hands dirty and, and get loose, get loose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Cause I think I could, I think I could achieve somewhat of the same look I have with watercolor, but uh, again, I don't, I haven't experimented with it in a long time. And you also get the happy accident of a medium like that, which is there, mm -hmm. are, no, there are no happy accidents in what you do. Everything is very yes, right? exactly. People say that you know you don't like do something with a vector, like huh? Yeah, I, I never figured it would do something like that, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. Wow, this was this has been great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm ADHDing. Right, right, well, right. I, I would also ask you, <laughs> what about now? You you 
if you go back and you look, uh, I would go and buy old art director's annuals mm. and you would look at stuff done in the twenties and the thirties, even in the teens that you would swear was done today. Very clean mm -hmm. design, especially starting in the twenties after the armory show and the modernists came over, you know, and started doing stuff. Do you ever go back and look through like, like the history of art? Like I always say in comics, one of the things that comics is actually kind of really bad at it. Unlike Hollywood, Hollywood celebrates its history. I always yeah. tell you, there's whole channels about old movies and yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. Comics is not that way. And illustration more, but I don't think quite as much as it could be, especially for people coming up, which is ironic because now you can type in anybody's name in Google and you see instantly. Yep. Yeah, but it's I, not curated. It's not cur you have to curate yourself. So yeah. I haven't I don't have a whole lot like a library of of reference to go back to but I was very inspired by Russian constructivism when I was in um, college yeah. and that like mm -hmm. chick hold and um, and we had a really good uh, uh, history of graphic design uh, art history uh, courses that really exposed us to a lot of stuff like uh, obviously Saul Bass and mm -hmm. um, and all the old ad agencies from the 50s and 60s. So that that's really where I got a lot of inspiration from in my education. So are there 10 are there 10 artists that you would recommend, you know, five artists you would recommend young people interested in doing what you're doing that they should look at? Um, I would say Saul Bass, Jan Chickhold, um Tom Whelan. <laughs> Tom, Whelan. <laughs> Tom Whelan. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on some more names, but yeah. uh, I would say history of graphic design is even more so than illustration because I don't I don't know a lot of those old illustrators from the like 40s and 50s by name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Vega, mm -hmm. definitely, um, but graphic design is where kind of where I laid my tracks. So you would say that, and, and the great thing also now about Google is if you put in Saul Bass, <laughs> you get yeah. three or four other people recommended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you would feel you do you feel that that was an, an important step in your development? Yeah, definitely. I think, and again, that's they kind of they're telling a story with very minimal, uh, very minimal strokes, and I think that really spoke to me too. Because I and again I love doing logo work, so that's that's another application of what I do. That uh, I'm I'm fascinated with logos and sports marks and uh, that's old trademark stuff. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, and there was that guy there for was big in a long time in the '80s. Lou Brooks who was doing all that kind of like little cute logos that looked like they were from the '30s and the. Mm -hmm. and, oh, right. and that stuff yeah. is almost timeless. It keeps coming up every. Every decade, I feel like that that look keeps coming up, and it still it continues to work. Hmm. All right, let's let's let Tom go pee. We, he's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> let's let let's this let is... all the people write him and ask. You know, ask yeah, free advice. advice. Yeah. Yeah. Free advice yeah. tonight only. Tom, you've been a fantastic guest. I hope that you uh, would, would will come back and grace us with your presence again. This was great. This was uh, yeah. a very quick two hours. I have to say that did not feel like two hours. So yeah, thanks, man. Kudos to you too. That's <laughs> very well done. I appreciate that, uh, uh, Tom. I hope you hang out with us while we close out the show. Yeah, uh, definitely. Before before uh, we let you go, Tom, where can people? I've been putting up your deal all night. <laughs> But <laughs> one uh, more time, yeah. Let people know where they can follow you at on the socials. Uh, so my website is uh, strongstuff.net. On Instagram, I am strongstuff, and on Twitter, I am strongstuff Tom because I wasn't quick enough. <laughs> that's funny. I was not an early adopter, so oh, that's cool. All right, it's well, funny. we were talking about this the other day. I know so many guys who from the early 2000s who were like bad at like getting their name and then getting their website and then they didn't renew and then they like all these guys like lost their they lost right. their web, their names or, yeah, yeah i do remember that it's like oh i lost it in the fire or i couldn't afford the the pay the domain fee that year yeah so i lost it yeah 
It's so, and it's so valuable. It's, yeah, especially yeah. now. Who knew, right? I know. I know. <laughs> Who could have saw this coming? All right, you guys. Well, I know what's about to happen. We're about to close the show. But before we go, I want to thank Tom again and thank all of our new guests and viewers that are watching. Uh, like I said, uh, we always get a lot of new eyes when a new person comes to the show. So please hang around. Like, subscribe, smash that alert button so you can uh, get more of this insider talk. It, you can only get it here, Pencil to Pencil. And, I, and I've been uploading little mini tutorials, yes. which I will continue to do. Mm -hmm. So spread the word. And especially get your friends to like it. Because the more likes we have, the more likes, the more... Mm -hmm. the, the, the better the channel will do, mm -hmm. and that helps us. Yeah, it really does. Uh, I think we're close to 500 subs on YouTube. I want to march to 1,000 uh, before, yeah, really soon because we need that. Um, I want to give a, a, a sneak peek of our next guest on Wednesday the 3rd. Uh, we'll have on the podcast Arthur Adams. Oh, man, what a lead in. <laughs> That's all time, my all time favorite artist. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, I hope you show up, Tom. To I will be here. Yeah. I will be here. Yeah. I will be here. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, you guys. Thanks so much. Um, remember, we're here every Wednesday, 8 p.m. EST. Put it in your calendar. Tell your mama to wake you up and remind you. <laughs> <her. laughs> yeah. And I don't know, Tom, if you know this, but we have a little outro. So, um, no, I did not. All right. Just, just play along. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. All right. Uh, so for myself and my good buddy, Mike Manley, and our disembodied head, Brett Blevins, smiling down above us, uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you next time. And don't, and don't forget to wash those curvy hands. Put them out, Tom. <laughs> oh, nice. That's, that's a nice curvy hand. Good job. All right, you guys. See you next time.